The first two years of Lieutenant General Richard Clark's tenure as USAFA superintendent have been a time of challenge. A global pandemic, growing political divisiveness, economic strain, and racial tensions have all contributed to a degrading of civil discourse throughout the nation. The Academy has not been immune from the ideological tug of war playing out across America. I recently caught up with General Clark to hear his perspective on topics that have concerned some within the Air Force Academy family. And in this first interview segment, we explore the controversy surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion training at the Academy, as well as ongoing efforts by USAFA to prepare warrior scholars for the future fight. I'm Heather Ubaraga, formerly Heather Healy, class of 1999, your host during these conversations, which are brought to you by the Association of Graduates and the Air Force Academy Foundation. I hope this video series answers some of the questions you may have. General Clark, thank you so much for sitting down with me. I appreciate it. Um, Thanks, Heather. There's been head some headlines about some recent DE&I training. Um, there are some folks who are calling the Air Force Academy or claiming the Air Force Academy is going woke. Um, what, how do you respond to that? And and do you understand this reference specifically? And, and do you feel like it was appropriate? I think it was uh, that this whole thing is a bit overblown, not a bit, a lot overblown. And I think uh, that some of the training that we're doing and the headlines about it were taken out of context. Um, and the first thing that I wanna say is our cadets can still say mom and dad. Mm -hmm. The headline said Air Force Academy prohibits cadets from saying mom and dad. And that's the one that just really got the spark. You know, that was the spark that started all this. Not in any way did we do that. If I ever said that, my mom would be the first one here mm -hmm. to <laughs> destroy me. And then my wife would be next in line. So not a chance on earth that we would do that. Um, now, what I will say is that diversity and inclusion training, DE&I training is important to us because it's a part of building leaders. And when, what people, I think what they imagine that we're doing is, is probably not what's actually happening here. What we're trying to do is build leaders that can connect with people, that can connect with anyone that they come into contact with because they're gonna be charged to lead a force that's more diverse than we've ever had in our country, that our armed forces have ever seen. And our cadets are gonna be charged to lead them. And if they can't connect with people that don't look like them, that don't talk like them, that don't have the same backgrounds or the same ideas, then they're gonna fail. They are gonna fail. And so we're just trying to give our cadets opportunities to develop themselves as leaders. They have to be in charge of their own development. And we're just trying to give them those tools so that when they do go out into our force, but also while they're here at USAFA, that when they come in to contact with people that they don't make assumptions about them, that they're exactly like they are. Um, that they come from the same kind of family situation that they did. Until they know what a person's context is, maybe they ought to um, kind of step back in how they speak to that person or how they talk to that person. For example, if you walk up to a person and say, are your mom and dad coming out for parents weekend? Maybe that person doesn't have a mom and dad. Maybe they were raised by their grandparents or an aunt, an uncle or something like that maybe say, do you have anybody coming out for parents weekend? And then they say, yeah, my mom and dad are coming out. Oh, great, where are your mom and dad from? And, and have that conversation and make that connection. That's just leadership 101. Understand your people, understand who you're leading and understand their context and respect it. And ultimately, it's all about dignity and respect. It's offering that to the people that you're leading because that's what builds trust in an organization that builds trust on a team. And if our cadets don't understand that, they're not gonna build the teams that, that build our Air Force and our Space Force. That is what our training is about, helping our cadets understand how do you build a culture of dignity and respect with a group of people that are coming from different backgrounds and then helping those people to move towards the common goal. That's to support and defend our constitution. No matter where you're coming from, that's what we expect of everybody that not only is here at our academy, but that joins our military, that joins our Air Force and our Space Force. And our cadets have to know how to 
how to point them in that direction so that they trust their leaders and that they execute the mission and that they understand that common purpose. So our, our, our DE&I training is simply, it is not the end. It is, that is a means to the end. The, the end is, is war fighting. The end is winning our future wars. The end is our national security and supporting and defending our constitution. DNI is just a means to that. That's what that's about. Yeah, actually, when I was preparing for this, it sort of made me think of Schofield's quote, Major General mm. John M. Schofield, graduation address, the graduating class of 1879 at West Point, spent a lot of time in the front leading rest learning that quote. Yes. But if you look at it, it's like, it's talking about, if you really break that quote down, it's talking about trust as the foundation for creating a reliable war fighting um, arm. So these aren't, you. This is Leadership 101. So you feel DE and I training is just a complementary approach to teaching respect at the, at the, and, and trust within leaders and teams. That's right. And, you know, I came in uh, to the Air Force 37 years ago. Our Air Force looked completely different than it looks now. Our Department of Defense looked completely different than it looks now. And we have to evolve. Our cadets don't get to... They don't get to choose the teams that they're gonna lead. They get assigned those teams. And then they need to figure out how do I take this team and move them to the objective and the, and the main uh, mission. So in my view, this is, this is exactly what you said. It's about dignity and respect. It's about how do you talk to people? How do you lead people? How do you understand them so that you can lead them? Um, and I, I know that some people say, why do we have to change? Why do we have to be different? Well, we have to evolve. We have to evolve. Uh, if we don't change with society, uh, then we're going to get left behind. And if we want to find ourselves in the future um, leading or, or relying on 30% of our population to go out and win our wars, we're going to lose. We need to be able to pull the best talent from 100% of our population, pull them into our academy, into our military, wherever they're coming from, and then drive to the, the ultimate goal of, of uh, defending our country. And so this is, this is about leadership and it's about leading our country to the ultimate goal. So let's talk about that for a second because I mean, there have been, there's been a lot of research done in the last decade on the quantifiable benefits of diversity. And sometimes, you know, we just talked about the respect component and the leadership component of it, but there are major advantages to having diverse groups. And when you have um, the same kinds of people with the same background looking out at any problem, whether it's, a, you know, a near peer or whether it's a legal issue or a business issue, when you have all the same people who think the exact same way around a group, uh, around a table trying to solve that problem, it's not going to turn out as well. So from a strictly, um, you know, war fighting lens, talk about the importance of bringing different people with different backgrounds, not just their ethnicity, but also maybe their education background, the joint forces, experiences in different domains. How does that make us better? It, it makes us better because it allows us to get different viewpoints, different opinions, different approaches to solving problems on the table and then to be able to evaluate those problems effectively and put them into motion, put them into action. And it, there's a lot of studies out there that say that diverse groups per actually perform better when they're led appropriately. Yes. But that's the key, how are they led? Now, I, I will, I'll admit it, it's arguable, right? Some people will say, well, it doesn't matter if a group's diverse or not, um, whether they're gonna be more effective than a, than a group that's less diverse. They can argue that. And, and let's just take that off the table then, whether a diverse group is more effective than a group that's not diverse. The fact is, our military is diverse, right? There's, there's not a choice here. It's not, we can't say, we're not gonna have diverse teams. We do have diverse teams. Now it's about how are we gonna lead those teams? How are we gonna make it so that um, our teams, our leaders are ready to lead the teams that, that are assigned to them, which we already know are gonna be diverse. How do we make them as effective as we can possibly be? There is no denying that our country gets more diverse 
every year. The, the latest census says it. it, it tells us that. Now, what are we gonna do with that as a military? How are we gonna pull the power of our population to win our wars and to support and defend the Constitution? That's what we're preparing our cadets to do. Let's talk about um, that for just a moment more because diversity in my mind, sometimes it's, um, you know, I'm a woman and there is a feeling that I sometimes get of, I will be potentially put on a leadership team one day because I'm a woman and they need that woman to check the box. And I think the least interesting thing about me is that I'm a woman. And that is certainly, um, it does provide a different perspective. It does provide an element of diversity to a team if they're dominated by men, perhaps. But what I find in a heavy engineering world, which is where I work, is that um, I'm a diverse thinker because I'm not an engineer. Mm -hmm. or I'm a diverse thinker because I have a degree in international relations or that I'm a veteran, which is actually not really common in some of these, um, in some of the engineering groups that I work. So diversity can be a whole host of Absolutely. variety of experiences that any you know, in, group of individuals brings to the table. Uh, you're exactly right. And, and sometimes people, they immediately jump to race, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the racial diversity or the gender diversity, but it's about thought. It's about um, where people come from, what their backgrounds are, but it also is about uh, a diversity in those other areas like race and gender and orientation um, and identification. All of those things matter and it, it just brings in people that think differently about problems. And we can't deny it that your background shapes who you are. And if we can find a way to take advantage and pull the best out of every person that comes our way, now we're bringing our bucket for solving problems, our bucket of solutions just gets bigger. And that's the beauty of, of being able to lead diverse groups. It, it's not just about gender, it's not just about race, it's about everything that a person brings to the table and being able to capitalize on that so that we build the best teams that we can have. It's, it's like a, a sporting team. And I know we, you know, I, I go back to that because I grew up playing sports all my life, but you get a team and you have some big players, you have some small players, you have some fast, some slow, some with good skills, whatever it might be, it's up to the coach to go, all right, where am I gonna put that person, that person and that person to give our team the best advantage to go out and win? They all bring some different skills. And you look at the team, they, every player looks a, a little bit different. They all have a, a, you know, different talents, different skills and abilities. It's up to the coach to go, all right, you're gonna play here, you're gonna do this, you're gonna do this, and then here's how we're gonna pull it all together. These are the plays that, that we're gonna run. This team is gonna run to execute and go out and win. It's the same thing for our, our leaders here. They're, think of them as coaches, think of them as leading teams that are going to go out and win. That's what we're trying to train them to do and to be able to understand the unique talents of every person on that team. Um, we have to be able to do that. And how to exploit those exactly. talents for the benefit of our national defense. Yes, and, and that, that's the goal. And if we can train people to first appreciate the diversity of their, uh, of their team and to create and appreciate how to include them in the team, to, to really put their talents to bear, we're gonna do great. We're gonna win and we're gonna push forward. And, and to be honest, our country's been doing this for a long time. I mean, from the beginning of our country, we've been diverse to, to a great extent. And we need to continue to capitalize on it. We're getting more diverse. Well, let's capitalize on it even more. And let's continue to pull that so that we can push forward and, and execute our national security. So you wrote a recent letter um, that cadets receive more than 1,000 hours of warfighting focused training and 16 hours of diversity training, which we've already just discussed as sort of all warfighter training. Tell me some of the highlights of what that training looks like. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So when, you know, when I wrote the letter, obviously that was uh, shortly after um, the headlines hit. And I really wanted to just get, get some um, information out to the community to say, listen, here's, here's really what we're trying to do. Please, you know, 
trust and understand us and, and where we're going with this. And in that letter, I did mention, I, I mentioned more than a thousand hours of warfighter training. At the time, that was what I was confident in. But as we really peeled back the onion and we really looked at what constitutes warfighter training, um, it, it really became apparent to us and evident that we are doing a good job of training warfighters. And so many of our programs that somebody might not call warfighter training really is. For example, um, we talk about um, uh, basic cadet training, right? In basic cadet training, what our cadre goes through to train our cadets, I, I consider that warfighter training. Even though they're not going through it, our basic cadets are, our cadre is getting just as much warfighter training and preparation to, to lead in combat as our basic cadets are. When we talk about um, a program like our warfighter talks that we have um, on a, a weekly basis with our cadets, that's warfighter training. Um, it matters for the cadets to understand what it looks like to be that warfighter of the future. Um, that warfighter that we're trying to prepare them to be. Um, so there's, there's so many things, and it's not just in academics, it's in the cadet wing, it's in combatives that we're doing down in the athletic department in our physical education. I honestly didn't consider physical education as warfighter training, but when we really looked at it, that's what combatives is all about. So there, there were a lot of other programs that I wasn't really uh, maybe considering warfighter training, but they are. That's what our school's about, and I, it never became more apparent to me that we're doing a good job of training warfighters. And when we talk about the diversity, equity, and inclusion training, that's just a part of it. Um, it is not the end state. It's just a, a small part of building leaders that are going to be ready to lead warfighting teams. Okay, so you originally said... 1,000 hours of training, but then you peel back the onion. And then after all, of looking at this more holistically and in depth, what, how many hours would you say of warfighting and training do cadets get? Well, when we peeled it back and we looked at every year on average, because the experience is a little bit different for every cadet, it's about 600 hours in a year that a cadet gets on what we would consider warfighter training, which equates to about 2,400 hours through the course of a four-year academy education, which I, I think is, is what we would expect, right? We're, it's a military academy. There, there needs to be a significant amount of warfighter training if we're gonna prepare them for those future wars. So we think we're, we're hitting the mark uh, when it comes to those things. And our commandant, our dean, our athletic director, all have a part in this. And those hours come from every element of our Air Force Academy to include our Center for Character and Leadership Development because a lot of their training is also about warfighting. It's about character in a warfighting environment. So 2,400 hours uh, is, is a lot of hours, but, but that's what we're about. We're a military service academy. Warfighting is our profession, and that's what we're preparing our cadets to do. Thank you for joining USAFA Superintendent Lieutenant General Richard Clark and me for our very first No Holds Barred conversation about the current status of the Air Force Academy. Remember to join us next week for our second segment when we'll discuss honor and character development, as well as sexual assault prevention efforts at USAFA. <laughs>